Hello there! So, today is going to be the first audio only episode of Taffy the Logolept. And that is because, well, uh, the script for this episode is over 10 pages long, single spaced. Yay! <laughs> Today's episode is a really special episode to me. Um, it's an episode of Tappy's Nerd Out. Yay! I'm going to give you a summary of some of my uh, thesis research that I did for my master's degree over the Prog Linguistic Circle. Now, my thesis itself is over a hundred pages long, and I can seriously fangirl about this topic. I could talk about it for hours and hours if I could. Um, but I figure you probably don't even want to sit still and look at my face for 10 minutes worth of information. So I have included some highlights here in the video, but if you want to hear the entire episode, there are some links down below to be able to check it out on SoundCloud and iTunes. And that way you don't have to sit still. You can work on other stuff and be able to listen to this really cool information that I want to share with you. Here are some highlights. Check the links down below and I'll see you next time. When I studied linguistics in school, I heard and read a lot of the same names. Steven Pinker, Noam Chomsky, Edward Sapir, Benjamin Worf, Leonard Bloomfield, Ferdinand de Saussure. In my research, I saw a lot of these same names, but I also found myself coming across something that was almost completely new to me. Prague. Sometimes it was called the Prague Linguistic Circle, the Prague Circle, Pragian Linguistics, L'Ecole de Prague, etc. And there were some names that I recognized. Roman Jakobsen was one that kept coming up, for example. But there were maybe hundreds that I had never even heard of before. Scholars who were doing a lot of linguistic research and making huge findings that clearly influenced modern linguistics. As I studied more, I began to feel like a definite disservice had been done to them. So today, I'm going to assume that, like 2013 me, you don't know hardly anything about the Prague Linguistic Circle, and I'm going to share with you why you should get to know them. The Prague School actually started because of ailing eyesight. In the early 1920s in Prague, Wilhelm Matthäus, a professor of English studies at Charles University, was producing groundbreaking research addressing what he called concrete problems in historical grammar, which we'll talk about in a minute. His poor vision, however, made it increasingly difficult to read letters of correspondence and reports from other researchers, students, and professors, so he preferred to meet in person so he could discuss these topics face to face. The first recognized meeting of this linguistic center was on October 6, 1926. Six men gathered to hear a presentation from visiting German linguist Dr. Enrich Becker on, quote unquote, the European spirit of language. Those in attendance enjoyed the meeting so much that they insisted on meeting regularly, about once every month, inviting members of their own group and outside thinkers with interesting linguistic contributions to speak about various topics. World War II and the Nazi invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1939 caused the work of the Prague School, understandably, to substantially decline. Czech universities closed their campuses and several members fled to other countries for their safety. Jakobsen and René Wellick, a student of Matthäus's, both fled to the United States, Jakobsen to New York and Wellick to Iowa. Although the Nazis destroyed many of the original documents of the Prague School, members like Jakobsen and Wellick were, thankfully, able to salvage and smuggle most of their work away from Nazi oppression. As a consequence, Jakobsen is probably the most well-known member of the pre-war Prague linguistic circle in American linguistics, not only because he lived the remainder of his long post-war life, he died in 1982, in the northeastern United States, but because Jakobsen's work is arguably some of the most substantial, at least of the work that has survived. Other papers were written but were prohibited from being published abroad. To this day, several are only available in Czech and Slavic. On a more comprehensive scale, however, not many of the Prague School's contributions are widely recognized, even in America. Prague School thought was effectively and significantly suppressed by the Nazis, who instead enforced the tenets of Russian formalism. Furthermore, in the 1940s, the French were gaining popular ground in their developing theories of structuralism. In 1946, Mukhzhovsky was invited to speak at the Institut d'Etudes Slaves in Paris about Prague School structuralism, but the result was dreadfully disappointing and really unfair. Parisian structuralists refused to translate and publish Mikorovsky's lecture in French, keeping it in Czech, thus rendering the challenging Prague School approach ostensibly inaccessible to much of any potentially interested audience in the West. Because of this effective marginalization of Prague School theory, the subsequent reception of structuralism in the West was heavily weighted toward the French. 
There are to date 50 to 60 individual thinkers who are credited as being members of the Prague School, and although it seems that the dynamic strength of the early Prague School is not entirely resuscitated, its work still lives and deeply influences the realms of linguistics and the study of narrative today. So there you have it, a little taste of some of the information about the Prague School. Remember to check out the links down below to SoundCloud and iTunes so you can hear the entire episode. You won't regret it, trust me. You will be a Logolep too if you listen to that entire episode. And uh, I will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> This right here, I don't know if you can see it very well. This is my um, my cheat sheet for the names of the men that were in the Prague School. Um, I consulted with a native Czech speaker to make sure that I was pronouncing some of these names right. Some of them are Russian and German also, so I'm just doing the best I can.